nations you will be glorified oh we glorify you righteous ruler righteous ruler be glorified oh be glorified Be glorified In and through all we do, God We lift you high, we lift you higher Be glorified Righteous ruler of the nations We lift you high be glorified righteous ruler of every nation oh we lift you high we lift you high be glorified be glorified oh Righteous and holy one, seated on his throne, be glorified as we lift you highest. We lift you high, we lift you high, we lift you highest. Jesus, holy Jesus. 
of the greater things we have tasted of the greater things in the holy place in the holy place and i'm gonna stay right here in the blood with you right here in the blood with you in the holy place in my rival place i'm gonna stay right here in the blood I'm gonna stay right here in the blood. I'm gonna stay right here in the blood. In the safety of your arms, I'm gonna stay right here in the blood. Yes. I'm gonna stay right here. Stay.
Staying right here with
your blood Thank you for the sacrifice given for us And thank you for the cross And thank you for your blood And thank you for the sacrifice given for us And thank you for the cross And thank you for your blood And thank you for the sacrifice Your wife. 
over this meeting, watching over us, Lord, and I thank you that this whole weekend will be a weekend of change and transformation forevermore. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. If you believe that, say amen. 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 You may be seated. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, it's always good to be uh, in Texas. Uh, you could say that, uh, you know, because it's so big. There's so many places you could go. But it's good to be in Amarillo and good to be here. I know Kevin and Kathy have been really looking forward to this uh, because he feels, they feel in their spirit that this is going to be a real uh, hot spot down the road. How many are okay with that? Yeah. All right. Well, in a minute we're going to take an offering, but I want to give you a few quick announcements about where we're going to be next. Uh, Kevin and Kathy uh, very soon are going to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, April 8th through the 10th. And then, especially for those who are watching, and then Virginia Beach, you need to come and be with, him, with us in Virginia Beach. It's going to be powerful. April 29th through May 1st. And then I'll give you one more. Uh, Pennsylvania, May 13th through the 15th. People ask Kevin, Kathy, hey, when are you going to come to the Midwest? Well, that's the best we're going to, they're going to do this year is Pennsylvania. So if, you, if you're anywhere from the Midwest North, uh, unless you live to the West, we're, uh, they're coming to Colorado Springs. All this travel with, Ke with Kevin, I'm, I'm learning my geography more and more. So if you live in anywhere like in Pennsylvania, Ohio, you know, Indiana, you can come to Pennsylvania and be with us. And, and so we'd love to see you. And that's one of that area where Kevin's going is one of the places where he used to live. So it's got a special place in his heart. So we're so thankful that uh, you're here, that you're a part of this. Uh, I see some kids running around, so if they have not registered for the simulator, make sure you see one of the ushers to, to make sure they're registered tomorrow for the simulator, and we're going to have a lot of fun with that. And uh, we're just excited to be here. Are you excited? So let me share with you, uh, as the ushers come, uh, you know, we read in the book of Acts, how many, how many remember this? Those who had abundance help those who had lack. So those who had lack to now, can now help people where they were themselves. Amen. That's a whole part of New Testament giving where all the people came in with their abundance. I just read the same thing happened in Exodus with Moses. Hey, Moses is like, we have enough. We have enough. And so that's giving. That's giving in the glory when there's more than enough and that way, everybody who has lack, because people do have lack, until they learn how to, how to get out of that and, you know, the principles. But those who have abundance, bless those who have the lack. So those who had the lack can now say, you know what, I've been there. Now, now I can help people 
because I'm the same way. I've been there. I grew up poor. And now the Lord has blessed me. And then the money just kind of flows through you. How many of you want to live like that? Amen. And that's what this ministry is all about. I got to tell you a quick little testimony. And uh, this is not to toot my own horn, in, own horn in any way. But I was at, somebody gave me $100 the other day, several days ago. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good. $100 cash. And so I, I would try to give it away, you know, uh, for a couple days, Kevin. And, and nothing would work. And so I was with my son having pizza. And the lady looked really stressed out, uh, you know, just helping all the people, you know, how they get. And, and my heart really went out to her, so I knew it was the Lord. And uh, I said, how much was the meal? She said, $29 for everything. I said, here's $100. I'm a pastor. I just want you to know Jesus loves you. you the look on her face. So you get it. So my point is, I don't know if I would have done that before I met Kevin because you think that $100 bill, oh, I'm going to need it, uh, you know. But you, you let it flow through you, amen? And so as, a, as you give tonight, it's going to flow through you. It's going to flow through the offering. And then it's going to touch single moms. It's going to touch children. It's going to touch the food ministry that we do and so on and so forth. You get it, amen? So, Father, thank you that we had the opportunity to give and be a part of this ministry. To, to Lord, Lord, we, we come cheerfully, ready to give, ready to be a part of what you're doing and sowing into the kingdom. Lord, I pray for every single person here that you bless their finances. Lord, I pray that, Lord, they just live in abundance forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ushers. If you're making out a check, you can make it out to Warrior Notes. And also, Anna has it up on the screen there. You can do text to give. Mike? Well, hello, Amarillo. I am so excited to be here. This weekend has been written down in books of destiny for years and years. So I hope you're ready because we are anticipating some incredible things to happen. There has been so much prayer, so much been sowed into this meeting, to this weekend. And guess what? You guys get to be the recipients of that. Amen. And if you're watching online, I heard someone yelling online, me too. Yes, you too. You're going to receive, and we're so excited to be here. Man, this is just going to be such a wonderful weekend. And we always like to start off by saying a big, big, big thank you to the partners because you guys are the ones that are making this possible. You know, for us, for as a team to be going all over and the truck and all these things that are happening, it's because of you guys. It's because of everybody that's partnering. So if you're a partner, would you just raise your hand? We want to honor you. Thank you, guys. Look at that. Hallelujah. Thank you guys so much. Seriously, every day, Kevin, Kathy, everyone, we're praying for you guys. We're believing that everything that's happening here is happening in your life, in your home, in your families. And let me tell you, the testimonies that we get every single day blow us away. Like there's no way anybody but God could have done these things. And it's, it's because we are a people that are coming together that are saying that we will seek God. We will knock on the door. We will seek, we'll run, and we're going to do it because we're going to make a difference in our generation. Amen? Amen? Amen. So with that, I know we've got a bunch of students here. So how many students we got here today? We got a bunch? Oh, yeah, good about, good about. All right, and Amarillo here. Changing the world for Jesus, right? Amen. And you online, we're so excited to have you guys online as well. And we're, I'm super excited. So can you tell I'm excited that I'm super excited? Well, I'm going to level up again because today we're releasing Dr. Kevin Zadai's new course, two courses on the precious blood of Jesus. Now, let me tell you, this is so powerful. Like if you've taken any of his courses or if you're at the spirit schools on power words, the blood, the cross, right? Those are the things that the world don't want to say. So we're going to say the blood, the cross, the blood, the cross, the blood, and the cross, right? And because that's everything, everything changes when it comes to the blood. Everything changes in our lives, right? So I want to encourage you, for you guys that are here, for those that are watching online, for you guys, you guys got your study guides. How many got your free study guides? Right? You can thank a partner for that. We're so thankful. Yeah, yeah please. That's wonderful. I don't, know any, I don't know any ministers like Kevin and Kathy that give free conferences, free products, free, free, free. But it's because there's destiny inside of you. And somebody has to stand up and say, it's time to make a difference. Right? And that's what Kevin and Kathy are doing. So listen, 
If you are a student, you already know you need to enroll in these courses because this is powerful stuff, life-changing stuff, right? And if you're not a student, I would encourage you to go to the book table. We've got little cards. You can come see us. And if you are a single parent, if you are a teenager, or if you're a military or first responder, we want to give you a scholarship at no cost. And let me tell you this. Speaking of free, and Kevin and Kathy, since that's why we're here this weekend, is there's no enrollment fees like there's nothing. All you have to do is just say yes. You just have to be willing to do it. And let me tell you, these courses are so powerful because it's like sitting and having mentoring one-on-one -on -one with Kevin. And if I hear anything the most, it's how can I have one-on-one -on -one time with Kevin? Well, if we lined everybody up and we circled the globe a couple times, maybe we could start to schedule it out. But this is how they've, this is what's in their heart to do that these courses are designed where you could sit down, you could personally receive and hear the experiences, hear the revelation he has, and then you could take it. Is, is, see the enemy didn't want me to say that, is that you implement it in your life. Because transformation is taking it and then applying it. Because we have a lot of people that want to hear it, but they don't want to apply it. And then they don't get anywhere, and then they blame everybody else for it. Uh-oh. So we're going to be ones that say, we will make a difference. Amen? Amen. Amen. Dr. Kevin Zadai. Oh. Yay. Hallelujah. You gotta thank you gotta thank the Lord for what He's doing. I'm telling you, um, if you've ever watched people surf, you know those guys. We were over in Hawaii um, once upon a time. We used to go all the time because it was $25 on my airline, so it was cheaper to go to Hawaii than it was to stay home. But we would go we would go and watch the surfers where they they professionally go on the what they call the pipeline. I think it is, and um, you either you either surfed or you died. It was like one of those things where these waves were like vicious and you either, you either lived or died, there was no in between. And, um, but it was amazing how they make it look so easy, but when you're in that water, it, it's, it's vicious and they make it look easy. And the thing it was is uh, the, the surfer said there was like this sweet spot and they would actually count the waves. And it was like every seventh wave was the wave. It was the way, there was a rhythm, you know. And I don't know if you've ever heard of anything like that, but there, there was a rhythm to it and they, they pick their wave. And th this, is what, this is what it feels like to me. I've had dreams years and years ago about sitting out there and nothing happening. And then all of a sudden a wave would come and I knew it was, it was the wave and I would ride it in and I'd have dreams like that. And that's God preparing for what he has for you. He kind of gets you in a mindset and a frame. But there, there is a, a rhythm to the seasons of God. And, and uh, just like there is with, with everything, uh, all the different uh, things that you encounter in this life, you, if you do something long enough, you see that there are rhythms to everything. And, and the way that you're learning, the way that you learn, all of a sudden it'll click with you. And then you just kind of lock in and, and it becomes predictable to you, easy. There, there is that place. There's a sweet spot if you, if you want to use that word. But there, there is a system, a world system that is also predictable, but it enslaves. And, you know, being, being a business person as you are, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, spend the money that's coming in to the, that the, comes in from taxpayers' money, you wouldn't spend it the way that they're spending it as a business person, right? It's, you know, I mean, it's mismanagement and people get thrown in jail if they do that in their business. But, but you can see that things are not being handled right. And it's the same thing, that's the same thing with your spiritual life. You know, you can find that sweet spot and that track where your gifting is, is being used in a, in a proper way. And you're, you become uh, accustomed to how the, God, the Lord uses you in your life. 
And, and it, we, we, everybody wants in the body of Christ, as a Christian, you want everybody to succeed in the body. You don't want anybody to fail. And as a business uh, manager, as a person who has a business, they don't want to fail and they, they want to train their employees not to fail. They, want, they don't go to work to, make, to, to lose money, they go to make money. And uh, it's the same thing with a counselor. He, a counselor wants to work their self out of that a certain assignment because they want people to get well, right? But if they keep counseling people for years and they, they want the income, they'll keep you, they, they don't want you to get well. And so if there's money to be made in a system, they'll keep you entrapped because it's all about money. I don't know if you've noticed that, but everything is about money. It shouldn't be, but the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's a trap. So physician, heal yourself. But see, that's not profitable for somebody to get well and not come back. It's not profitable for you to pay off your house for, for, for the system because they're making 80, 90% until the seventh year before you pay off your, you don't want a 30 year mortgage, mort gauge, mort means death and gauge means grip, death grip. So 30 years of paying a mortgage, you don't really start pay, paying into the principal in a large amount until the seventh year before you pay it off. It's called amortization. So it's, it's loaded so that you pay most of what I would call a penalty for borrowing the money up front. Do you understand? So if people, if their intention is to enslave you, then they don't want you to find your sweet spot. And they don't want you to prosper and they don't want you to get well. And they don't want you to have healthy, uh, healthy relationships because if a group of people get, get in agreement and rise up and say, I want to bring it back to the people. And you start talking like Marth, Martin Luther King, well then all of a sudden you just, you, you, don't, you just disappear. If you notice the leadership that has risen and was for the people to hand it back to the people, talking about the constitution, talking about being represented correctly, well then those people get into trouble. But that is what you're called to do. You're called to help others. So you're valuable and you bring that value to other people. That's the body of Christ. That is the body of Christ. Jesus brought value to us. He, he paid the price and then he, that, that gave you value. Now your value is that you're supposed to encourage and build each other up in the body until we reach the maturity of the faith and the, the unity of the faith. So there's maturity and unity that is mentioned in Ephesians chapter four. So this weekend, I wanted to bring to you a subject that has become, um, it's like an archeology, span it's like an archeology span subject. It's called the blood of Jesus because it's like, now you gotta dig to get even a sermon on the blood of Jesus anymore. And um, it's like, it's like a, a lost art. And it shouldn't be because it's really the foundation for, for Christianity. And you, you know, the, every generation this happens. So you've got to have people that rise up like you and you start to talk about these things so that they don't die. And um, you know, you, you think about some of the things that have disappeared in our generation and how yet we would never let the zebra disappear or Shamu, you know, we, we, they have more rights than we do. So we're not gonna let any animals go extinct, you know? So Fluffy's gonna, gonna last because he has rights, right? But Fluffy doesn't care about anything except the next meal and a walk. And this is, this, this is how you can tell the world system's working is that human beings become secondary. And only the elite prosper. This is what happened, exactly what happened during the time of Jesus. 
And it got into the religion of the day, which was um, Judaism. And the Pharisees were the head honchos. But they were far from God, and that's why Israel was taken over by Rome. At the time of Jesus, there, there was occupation by Ro the Roman government. So when Jesus is walking around the streets of his city in his country, which, is, which was God designated as his land, in the Bible, it's the only place that God says, this is my land. So it's the most disputed territory on the earth. For It's ridiculous. Because it's just a bunch of... of of Middle Eastern people fighting. And, and Abraham was in southern Kuwait, or northern Kuwait, southern Iraq, in Ur of the Chaldees in Sumeria, which is where Nimrod ran after the Tower of Babel. When, when, when Nimrod was one of the, the, the hybrids, he was a Hagaborim in Hebrew, one of the giants. He says he was a Hagaborim, one of the mighty ones. When, when that all happened, he bailed because he, they, were killing, they were killing these giants, you know, all through. David killed them. Um, God killed them. Yeah, God killed them. He, he drowned them. But he fled. Nimrod fled over into Iraq. And you can see a couple of the cities there that he built. It's in the Bible. If you want to bring the Bible into it. You know, he, he went over there into the, right in there in northern Iraq. I mean, a northern Kuwait, I keep saying that, southern Iraq, in the area of Sumer, a lot of weird stuff. If you want to read for, for 400 hours and never exhaust it, read about Sumer and Ur of the Chaldees. It is spooky. The races of people that just appeared and then disappeared. And, and all the stuff that has to do with that, you, it would explain a lot of the mysteries these days that you don't understand anything about. But our government does. A lot of the archaeology explains a lot of things that they don't want you to know about. Okay, so there was this man named Abraham who was Abram. He was there in Ur of the Chaldees. I mean, just check it out. And I'm doing this to show you something about the blood of Jesus. That, that there was, there was a hybrid races that, that were not right. God destroyed the whole earth because of the interbreeding. So that's how bad it was. He destroyed the animals because of the interbreeding. And you can't get away from that in Genesis chapter 6, no matter what. You cannot get away from the fact that God was grieved that he had made man. Now, if you think he was grieved about Adam and Eve, if you look at the language that's going on there, it was worse in Genesis chapter 6. Because he had to destroy the whole race. Except for eight people. So Abraham, who was Abram, had God appear to him. And gave him the information that he needed about covenant. And about that he wanted to make a covenant with him. And that he was going to make a nation out of him. And that his descendants were going to be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, which is a lot. Even what you get in your, in your clothes and your shoes after being on the beach is, is plenty. <laughs> let alone all the beaches in the world. Okay, so that's how many descendants. So when you get to heaven, Peter won't, won't necessarily be there waiting for you. It'll be Abraham. Because he's your father. He's the father of all. I mean, if you want to bring Galatians chapter 3 into it. If you don't, then, you know, he's not your father. But he is your father. And we have inherited everything that the Jews inherited. Through Abraham. Through that covenant, okay? All right, but when he, was, when he left that area, because God told him to leave, he, if you look, he was a moon worshiper, a crescent moon worshiper. And if you look at the symbol, it's the same as Islam today. Oh, yeah. So he left. God, God appeared to him and said, listen, I'm going to make a coming. I'm going to make you a nation. And it's, it's amazing that this, this Arab became Israel through, his, through Isaac and then Jacob. And then Joseph was who was sent to Egypt. Then Moses took all of Joseph's descendants out 
into the promised land. Abraham was told to offer up his only son on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, if you check it out on a map, even if even if you are the biggest skeptic, if you just look at a Bible in the back, Mount Moriah was where Golgotha was. It's exactly the Temple Mount. It's exactly where is the city of Jerusalem is today. And he was told to take Isaac up there, and you know the story, but it's interesting in Hebrew, we get, we, we get the, the word uh, yira, J- you call it jira, but there is no J in Hebrew. It's yira, Jehovah yira. And it's not even Jehovah as we know it, it's, there's, it's, it's, it's hidden what his real name is because it's, it's abbreviation that we don't know, we can't fill it in because there's no vowels in Hebrew. It's not supposed to be known but if you, if you check it out, the name above all names is Jesus. So it's not really a mystery anymore. But the high priest was only allowed to speak that name in, in the Holy of Holies once a year by blood. By blood. He had to have blood. He went in once a year. He had to enter in through, through the Holy of the Veil. And he had to have the blood. And he had to apply it to the, to the mercy seat. And then he was allowed to announce the name of God. This was once a year for the forgiveness of sins. But see, Fluffy doesn't have to die anymore. This was just to get us to this point. So anyway, getting back to this, Abraham, his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, which became Israel, they were all Kuwaitis or or Southern, they were Iraqis. And now they're fighting each other. And why do they all hate Israel? Can you hate your own family? So isn't it interesting that other countries invade countries like what's happening and they're fighting their own people because these, these soldiers are being sent down there and they're going to their own hometowns that they used to live at and grandma's still there and they're, they're, they're destroying their own hometowns. And that's why the soldiers are crying. We, they're deserting because they can't do this. Well, this is what war does. But God, is in, he loves people. So it's not about countries. And that's why, you know, people ask, why aren't you talking about prophetic events and all that? I go, because it, it becomes pathetic instead of prophetic when you don't discern that God loves people. And that this is the way it's been The lines are drawn between countries because the devil's territorial. But God's not territorial like you think. He has He has has done what He can do for humanity, and He is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God right now, waiting for His enemies to become His footstools. Well, there's enemies in all the countries, but there's also His children in all the countries, and there is not one person that should go to hell. So you know, Vladimir. He, 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 he's, he's slated to go to heaven, even though he, he may not. But you may not either, if, if, unless, I mean, if you want to bring the Bible into it, if, if, you do not, if you do not discern what Jesus Christ did for you, Jesus might not know you. And all the apostles said, listen, make sure you make your calling and election sure. Paul said, uh, be sure that you have Christ in you. He's talking to the church. In other words, there is a point where you could lose your salvation, even though people don't believe that. So I don't say it. So I never said it because it offends people. But Jesus, Jesus said, listen, many will come to me on that day. I say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons and heal the sick? I never knew you. Get away from me. It's still in the Bible. Can you believe it's still in the Bible, even though it's offensive? They haven't cleansed that, I guess, you know. <laughs> so Jesus was offensive sometimes because the truth sometimes um, is, is hard to take because it, 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 you, have to be allow, you have to allow yourself to have God appear to you in your country and say, I'm going to make you a nation and then take you out of your country, give you a new name and make you a nation. So you have to leave your old ways and all the ways you think and 
God, he said, well, where are we going? And he said, I'll tell you when you get there. That was, that was why he's mentioned in the faith chapter. Okay, so that this, this is like what I want to talk about this weekend is that Isaac, Isaac was laying on the altar and he was in his 20s. And this is what Abraham said. Abraham said this to the, there was the group that he left down there. He didn't bring them up. He, he said, We're get, me and the boy are going to go up and worship and then we will return. We, okay? Then when, when Isaac said, you know, we got the fire, we got the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And in, in Hebrew, we, we, we know it is, is Jaira, but it's Yira, but, you know, the Lord, the Lord, the, it really means the Lord sees. And it's, the implication is the Lord sees, thus he provides. So we have a Jehovah Jireh, our provider, you know, and we have that, that songs that go with it and the movie to follow and, you know, we, but it says literally in Hebrew, what Abraham said to his son was, Jehovah sees himself the sacrifice is literally what it says. He told Isaac that. And he rose that, he rose that knife up over him uh, on exactly where Jesus was crucified years later. Does everybody follow me? Or do I need to go over the whole thing again? This was a plan from the beginning. God had, God had this already instituted from the beginning, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world, it says in the book of Revelation. The lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. This was the plan for man. This was always the plan for you. All these things were planned for you before you were born that you would come to the knowledge of God, accept Jesus as your Savior, and then right away be implemented into the Abrahamic covenant, which became Jesus' blood on the same mountain. And isn't it funny that right there, that peak, if you look on a, on a map, you can look it up, it's, the altitude is 777 meters. And you know, it's interesting that David took the head of Goliath and he said, it says he buried it in Jerusalem. He took the head of Goliath with him. And you know, Goliath was from Gath. Isn't it funny that it's called Golgatha? Goliath from Gatha, Golgatha. So Jesus, where he was crucified, he look right down, and he was crucified over the head of the giant. And his blood defeated that hybrid race. He died as a pure human being. Noah was on the ark. He was the only one that was perfect in his genetics, in his gene generations, it says. Only eight. Only eight. I held up five, but eight. Okay, so this, this is, this, I had to do this first so that you understand this weekend a little better. So I'm going to get right into it. Um, I, I want you to turn to chapter one um, and... Make sure that you listen to your CD as well because this backs up all the scriptures on the blood of Jesus. It's very important that, that you play it really loud so that the demons can hear it as well. <laughs> because they will, respond to the, they will respond to the blood of Jesus because, see, the blood of Jesus is powerful because all of the genealogies in the Bible, they're in there to trace from Adam to Mary that Jesus was a pure human being without any hybrid blood in him. There was no hybrid genetics in his bloodline. This is, this is very important. Every genealogy in the Bible shows that that race never got into the bloodline because Mary, Mary had blood but she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. So God himself was the father 
of Jesus. And it proves that he was pure human stock. It's very important because life is in the blood. Now, in the end times, this is why it's very careful. You have to be very careful about anything that alters your genes. And I'm not talking about your blue genes. Your dog can alter your genes by biting them. But there are things that can happen to your genetics that alter you. If you get to where you are 51% something else, then you are no longer classified as human. You gotta understand that Satan did not want Jesus to be fully human. Because the, the blood sacrifice had to be a fully human being with no blemish. That's talking about genetics. Because it was a genetic flaw if you had blemishes as a lamb. They looked to see if you had a flaw. And that's why certain sacrifices were not acceptable when they were brought. Because they had to be unblemished. Does everybody follow me? This is because it is an example of what was happening in Genesis chapter 6. With human beings as well as animals. So it's always been about the blood. And it's always been a battle about genetics. And so this subject of the blood of Jesus is disappearing from people's messages. Because, because it, it, if, you, if, you, if you talk about the blood of Jesus, what you're saying is, is that there was a perfect sacrifice that was paid for you and that your sins are forgiven. But like I said, the world system does not want you to feel forgiven. It doesn't want you to be healthy. It does not want you to be out of debt. Everything is set up so that you never really get well. They want you to come back and try another prescription, try another counseling session, try a reverse mortgage. You know, and it's just like, it just keeps changing. It's like, what about uh, paying off my house? What about, like, did you notice that there's very few people that offer a solution where it's, it's taken care of? So how many people will sit down with you and say, okay, we're going to get you out of debt. We're going to get you well. We're going to get you married with a good person. We're going to get you in a good church where they actually help people. You'll, you'll see this. It's all about the blood. It's all about you. God loves people. And he, but he wants to resolve problems. He took care of the sin problem. But it, why is it that we hear all these messages about the end times and about current events and about our sinful condition and about, you know, oh, we're going to have trouble here and everything. And yeah, you don't have to tell people that. Just... Just go out of your house. Don't even go out of your house. You're, you're going to have, in this world, you're going to have trouble. We know that. But it shouldn't be hell on earth. It should be. It talks in the Bible about days of heaven on earth. I wrote a book about it. Because no one was talking about that. And everybody was saying, listen, the devil told me this this week. And um, the devil did this week. And I go, well, what did an angel do? Did an angel talk to you? Or did, what did an angel do? Did God talk to you? Oh, I don't hear God's voice. Oh, okay, so you just told me word for word what the devil told you. And the devil's moving. Yeah, the devil's on the move. He's moving. So he's allowed to minister to you. But, but God's not allowed to minister to you or the angels. So, it's, it, no, I, I'm, 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 I'm totally honest. When I was at work... You could talk about this terrible thing that happened and this and this. And, um, you know, and, and people, if they can relate to you, they, they like you. Okay, but if you want to sit with your, your friends, if you're Job and, and you sit and your friends come and sit with you and they, they just have a pity party with you, but they, they go, yeah, God works in mysterious ways. And they're, you know, do you want me to cut myself too with you? You know, just so I can, you know. And it's like, no, it's like, it's like if I come to somebody who's cutting themselves or is having bad dreams or is sick, I'm going to be like, okay, 
take my hand. We're going to walk out of this. We're going to walk out of this step by step. And it's like, is it going to be hard? No, it's not going to be hard because you just do what I do. This is what Paul taught us in his, in his messages. And he did it from jail. If, if he can write like he did from jail, what can you do out of jail? Okay, so Paul wrote all these things, these wonderful things from jail he was, he was messed with all the time, okay? Whether he went out and spoke in public, they beat him up, and he was actually safer in jail. So here's, here's something interesting I wanna, I wanna uh, that we're gonna start with cha- on uh, chapter one here. It's page three, but I wanna read something to you that is very interesting because uh, I woke up and I got four messages for this weekend that are not in this study guide. I'm like, great, now how am I going to do this? Here? So um, I thought, well, this is what I'll do. Since I only have three extra minutes a day, I got I to gotta figure out how I got to deliver these messages and still, and still keep with what with what the Lord, you know, is wanting for this weekend. Okay, so in chapter 10, right, just write Hebrews 10 down, and then I'm going to read something from verse 11. I'm going to read, it's going to seem like a long time, but just pretend like you're interested. This kind of sums it up because uh, in verse, okay, let's start with verse 15. Well, no, we got to start with the verse 11. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. Okay? Verse 12. But our high priest, our high priest, in capital letters, that means it's Jesus, our priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. It never expires. It doesn't have an expiration date, like your macaroni and cheese. <laughs> your closet. He said, then, then he, okay, so he did that, okay? Then it says this. It's profound. We, we, we kind of miss this because we go over it too quickly. It says, then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand, okay? And that is exactly what's happening right now. Right now, right now. So he's done everything he's gonna do about your sin, and he's seated right now, and you're still worried about your sin. And he's over it. He's gone on to the next phase. So he's at rest right now. He's accomplished everything that the God the Father required to forgive sins. However, now is placed back in our court, and we're blaming God, but God says, well, if you notice, the ball is now in your court. It's your time to return. It's, a, it's your action now, your response. So we're like, come on, are you playing tennis or not? It's like, well, I just served. Did you not see it come by you? And they're like, well, you know, it's your fault. It's like, okay, so it's my fault that I served to you. Well, you served it too fast. I can't return it. Well, that's just the way God is. He, he's very quick. He's done. He's seated right now. And Jesus has done everything he's going to do about sin. And I mean that. And Jesus actually said when he's on the earth, he goes, and the God of this world, the prince of this world is already judged. He said that before he died. Because he was slain before the foundations of the world. It was already done. But that's kind of hard to handle unless you, you know, you have at least two candy bars and get sugared up. You can't, like, comprehend these things because you're, what Paul says, you're dull of hearing. How I long to take you on, but you're dull of hearing. And we have to go over these things again, over and over again. And, and so he's, he sat down at a place of honor. Now, in verse 13, this is exactly where we are right now. But you wouldn't believe it by the way you look at how people are, are cooperating with God. They're, 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 if you Listen to what it says in verse 13. This is chapter 10. It's still in the Bible. And the nearly inspired version hasn't even taken it out yet. 
it says this right here. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by the one offering he made forever, perfect those who are being made holy. So now he's given the keys to the church. He's, he's commissioned us. And now the body of Christ, which is part of Christ, because we are the body, he's the head. He's the head honcho. We're never going to be the head honcho. We're going to be the body. But we are part of Jesus Christ on the earth. We're the body. Okay, literally, Jesus is sitting waiting for the church to bring the enemies to his feet so that he can put his foot on their head. Okay, which is really weird because I've lost friends because I said that God's, God's enemies are your enemies, but also your enemies are God's enemies. And I had people get upset with me because of that and unfriend me. <laughs> and I thought, well, have they not investigated what's really going on? But the book of Hebrews is a supernatural book. Do you know that there, there is no indication on who wrote Hebrews? It's a supernatural book. It's one of the most profound books in the Bible. It's my favorite today. Tomorrow it'll be some, but something, something else. But okay, for by this offering he forever made perfect. Forever made perfect? That's us. And you still want a facelift. I'll tell you, the best facelift is to look into the face of Jesus and start to become more like him. But that's offensive. See, the blood is offensive. When you talk about the blood of Jesus, it's very death, the cross, blood. These are all judgment. These are all offensive. But, but Paul said, listen, if you come to the table and drink of the blood of Jesus, which is talking about the cup and the, and the bread. He said, if you drink that unworthily, you drink judgment upon yourself. That's offensive. So you're not going to hear that. You're going to hear about the animals on the ark on Sunday. You're not going to hear about people dropping dead. Because he said, he said, listen, some of you come and you don't discern the body of Christ. You don't do it right. And many of you are weak, sick, and die early. When have you heard that sermon? Well, that doesn't bring in big offerings. <laughs> but there's always going to be a person in every generation that will be not tied to money where it doesn't matter if they give or not. The message will still come forth. So even if you don't give, I'm still coming back. I'll keep coming back. You can shut off the lines. Doesn't matter. There's plenty of lines. You, can, you, can, you, can, you can't control the message if you can't control the messenger. So I'm dependently wealthy. I depend upon my father. But see, you should be in that same place. You should be dependently healthy and wealthy. You should... You should be able to function in this realm and go to work and actually prosper. And you should be in good health, even as your soul prospers, if you want to bring the Bible into it. Because that's what Paul said in, to the Thessalonians. He wished that they would prosper, just as their soul prospers. How else is the message going to get out? If you go to the Christian bookstore and, and get a Bible and you walk out without paying, you're going to jail. Because it costs something for that Bible. So the word of God is not free. It's free as far as the message goes. But as far as this world and the way that it gets to you, it costs money. That's why Paul took offering. But he said, this is not for me. I'm, I'm well done. I'm well kept. He said, this is for your benefit. 
And he said, um, this is to distribute to those who are in need. So look at that corruption that's happened. Look, where, where is that gone? It's supposed to be so that the body is, it has equality and everything. We're supposed to help each other. And, you know, I, because I can't say this in church, that's why I rent a hotel, is the money was never even supposed to leave the building. They, they would bring the money up and then it was distributed. That's what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. If you look at what, what uh, Pastor Ryan read in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, it was so that those who were prospering at the time could help those who were not at the time. Because things change, you know. And it, he just wanted everybody to be equal. Be why? Because we have a, an assignment, a mission down here. We have a ministry of reconciliation. I mean, if you want to bring Paul into it, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you know verse 17 because you, you quote it all the time. There, you know, you're a new creation in Christ. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things behold come new. But if you read the whole chapter, you find out that we have a ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to go out, it says, and tell people that the price for sin has been paid. Because Jesus is seated right now. I mean, if you want to you know, go back and read this, he's seated right now. He's not doing another thing about it. And, and just to irritate some people, he's not doing another thing about the devil either. Right. He's, al he's, he's already defeated him, made a show of him openly. That means he drug him through the streets behind him. That's what that literally means. Made a show of him. The powers of this age have come to nothing. He defeated him through the cross. It literally says he destroyed the works of the devil. These are all Bible verses. If you read 1 John, if you read, you know, you'll never, you hardly ever hear a sermon on 1 John. You don't hear much from James because James would not be invited back if he came to your church. Okay, so we had this, this, this old covenant that was established became a new covenant. It, it was based on better promises. It was based on the blood of Jesus himself instead of goats and lambs and little fluffy things. It is based now, it's a better covenant with better promises. So the Holy Spirit is saying this According to Hebrews, verse 16 of chapter 10 says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people. He's talking about Jeremiah. Jeremiah's prophesying this in Jeremiah 33. Okay, so he's saying, this is the new covenant I will make with my people. On that day, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. Okay, wait a minute. I thought they were on tablets of stone. He's going to put them in your heart. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he says this, I will never again, never again. Did I mention never again? I will never again remember their sins and their lawless deeds. Now this is Jeremiah and you know, you can check down here. You can go down to the bottom. It's, I'm sorry, it's Jeremiah 31, 33. Okay, so... 33 and 34 of chapter 31 of Jeremiah. He prophesied this. And, and this is being quoted now as the basis of the new covenant. When So after the writer of Hebrews says all this, and he quotes Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 18 he says this, And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Period. So what are you doing trying to get God to love and accept you? Why are you doing that out of the fact that you feel guilty? You feel guilty for your past sins, but it's unbiblical. Because as a Christian, you're either forgiven or you're not. Either it's over or it's not. Either you, 
you're paid in full or you owe. And off to work you go. Hi ho, hi ho. No, do you, do, you go, do you go to work in the spirit to make God forgive you? Are you still working to please him because you are so rotten? Or are you just forgiven and it's by grace? See, this is how, this is the name of the message. It's called the spirit of grace. And it says here that you can insult the spirit of grace. How can you insult somebody when you misinterpret their intentions? When you don't take the gift graciously and receive it and be thankful for it and let it be yours. It's when you don't really take it in, you don't receive it. Why? Because you think you're unworthy. But the bottom line is none of us are worthy. Period. And left alone, every third chapter, if you look by the third chapter, they messed the garden up, so they got kicked out. So now they're outside the gardening department. So by chapter six, God has to destroy the whole earth. Three chapters. <laughs> and you keep adding it, go to nine and 12, and you got Babel, you got all this stuff, all messed up. See, left to ourselves, we just mess things up. So grace is when God just goes ahead for, and foreknowledge, he provides for us, perhaps knowing that he, he knows that his goodness being revealed will cause people to repent. I mean, if you want to bring the Bible into it, because that's what Paul said in chapter 2 of Romans. He's, he didn't say the fear of hell, damnation, and punishment will bring people to repentance. Paul said that it's the revelation of the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. So you can see this world system got into the church where it controls people. Bringing fear of condemnation and punishment even to people that have committed their life to Jesus Christ. Because what I've just read to you can judge you if you don't believe this way. It'll bring judgment to you because Jesus has already done it. And the Holy Spirit, which says the Holy Spirit says... And I'll just read it again because I, I know that we all, we all need this. We all need this, okay? It says, the Spirit says, testifies this, through Jeremiah. This is the new covenant I will make with my people. And I will write these laws in heart. They will never, I will never again remember their sins. The Spirit is saying that. If the Spirit said it through Jeremiah, do you think he's still saying it today? Okay, this, this is Hebrews. He's talking to Hebrew, Hebrew Christians in the New Testament. It's talking to the church. It's not talking to the people of the world. All right, so verse 19 says this. Dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter in. Boldly. Well, that doesn't go well in church. When you start talking about, well, no, we've got to crawl on our knees. And hopefully God will let us in today. And um, you, you got churches, you know, like it, it, when I did my thesis, you, you wouldn't believe, like, the, when you look at the menu that I found in my thesis on the Catholic Church, where it was a list of all the sins and what you had to pay to be forgiven for them. And this wasn't that long ago. So when Martin Luther saw that there was one, only one mediator between God and man, and so he, 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 he nailed those theses to the wall or the door, and he said, listen, there's only one mediator between God and man, and you are not on that list. He told the church that. We don't need the priest. We have a high priest. Well, think how revolutionary that is. But see, everybody that stands up for the people and says, hey, hey, wait a minute, and starts messing with the system. You know, that there might be something in your yard that you could cook and it would get you well. Well, that doesn't make any money. What if something boosts your immune system and your body heals itself? 
Well, then what, what happens is, is you don't have to go to the pharmacy. You go to your backyard or you go to your tree or you, you, know, you go get something that, that your body needs to help fight disease. You, you get a way to start paying off your mortgage in increments to where you speed up the process so that the death grip doesn't get you. And with relationships, you don't need more counseling. You need to become the person that somebody needs. You see, all the counseling is is processing you, helping you process things. But the bottom line is, if, if, if a counselor would tell you that you're the problem, or you come back next week, Because it'll show if you really want, if you really want the result. And uh, people are like, you know, people are like, they want to get married. I'm like, well, <laughs> and they think, well, I guess my spouse just isn't ready for me yet. And I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> Nobody's ready for you. <laughs> See, they're used to their dog waiting for them every day when they come for work. But Fido just wants a snack. <laughs> but they wait there for them. Oh, I just love you. Feed me. Walk, walk. Brings the leash, you know. See, animals love people more than humans do sometimes. But there is an agenda. There's always an angle with, with everything. Jesus had to deal with all these kind of things. He knew what was in a man, so he never committed himself to a man. I mean, if you want to bring John into it, because John said that. John said that Jesus knew what was in a man. He knew that he would get, that the, every man would throw him under the bus to preserve themselves. And that's exactly what happened. But when you have a revelation of what Jesus did for you and that goodness of God, it leads you to repent, which means you do a 180. You, it's really where, you, see, where you look is where you're going. Where your focus is, is where you're going. It doesn't matter. If you're focused on something, you'll start talking about it. That's your rudder. So wherever you focus on, you're going to go to that. But you're never going to improve if you're staring at where you already are. You can't go anywhere. This new covenant, it is, un I was in heaven, it is unlimited there, the potential is beyond words or anything that you could ever imagine. Anything that you can imagine hasn't even entered into your heart yet what God has prepared for you. It has never entered your mind or your heart the things that God had. But it says it is revealed to us by the Spirit. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Spirit leads us into all truth. The Spirit knows the thoughts of God. So, you know, when it says, I know my thoughts toward you, I know my plans toward you that is a good and expected end, plans for you to prosper. Well, you know, see, that's Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, 11. He wouldn't be asked to most churches because he's talking about prosperity. I think it's interesting that Abraham left. You can see where he left. A couple chapters later, chapter 13, as soon as he left his own hometown, all he had. By chapter 13, it says Abraham was very rich. But see, I can't say that. And then, and then his son Isaac paid attention, was just like daddy. So Isaac sowed during a famine, and it says he reaped a hundredfold that year. Not a hundred times, a hundredfold the same year, without any rain. And what did the devil do? It says that the Philistines came and plugged up his father's wells that he had given to Isaac. That was the source, was his inheritance that he got from his father Abraham. The devil, through the Philistines, went and plugged up the source of his prosperity, which was his inheritance from his father. His father had dug those wells. You all follow me? It's the same thing with Jesus. We, we inherit everything that Jesus inherits because he said that we are going to share with him. And Paul said that we're, we're fellow heirs with Jesus, co-heirs. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Jesus. So your inheritance 
your prosperity in every area of your life is based on what was handed to you. So Jesus handed it to us and is seated now. And he's waiting for us to do our part. And this is where the world system came in and the Pharisees were part of this problem with Jesus. They're the ones that fought him. I mean, the people that were poor and sick, they didn't fight him. They needed healing. They needed help. They needed food. So Jesus fed them. That's why we feed people. That's why we hand out money. That's why we do what we do is because that's what Jesus did. But see, it's a handoff. It's an inheritance. He said, listen, you're going to do the same things I'm doing. Well, can you walk on water? Because that, that's, he says you're going to do greater things than that. Well, I, I don't know what's greater. Maybe we'll walk in the air. I don't know. But my point is, have we reached even matching what Jesus did? Because that scripture is still there, and he did say that. Okay, so at least we should be driving out demons, uh, healing the sick, preaching jubilee, which is debt cancellation, and raising the dead. Pretty easy, right? No, it's not us. It's the Spirit. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless the Father tells me. I don't, I don't do anything, I don't say anything unless the Spirit. He said, when the Spirit comes, he's going to be the same way. He's not going to speak on his own either. He said, he's coming. When I leave, I'm going to send him. And he's going to be one like me, and he's going to be with you forever. And he is not going to speak on his own. So the Spirit in you is going to speak in behalf of the Father. So the Spirit is not going to concentrate on, on certain subjects, including the minister. He's not, going to, he's not going to be talking about the minister through the minister. He's going to be speaking forth the Father's heart. If you notice, Jesus didn't say to the rich man, you know, you just lack one small thing. Just give everything you have to the poor, not to his ministry. Jesus said, don't give it to my ministry. He said, give it to the poor. Why did he say that? Because then the man could never get it back. Because see, if he gave it to his friends or he gave it to Jesus, it was a leverage. It was to pay to play. And that's what, that's what people do now. The, the politicians do that. So if you're not in, you're not in. So that man had to give it away with no chance of ever getting it back unless God paid him back. But he, if he knew everything, he was perfect, right? He said he was perfect in all the law. Then he would have known that he who lends to the poor lends to the Lord. And the Lord pays great dividends. He would know that, but he, I guess he wasn't perfect because he went away sad. It says, right? Does everybody follow what I just said? Okay, so people are not counting the cost. But see, Abraham did. Isaac did. When Jacob, when it came to Jacob, Jacob didn't even know that Bethel was where Abraham, his grandfather, and his father Isaac had built an altar. Had built that altar, and they would visit there. When Jacob was running, and he accidentally, he was tired, he accidentally stopped there by default, he put his head on that rock, which is probably one of the altar rocks, and slept and had a dream about the, a vision about the angels coming back and forth from heaven in that spot. But see, it was Bethel. It was the gate, it's called the gateway of God. And the, Abraham knew that, Isaac knew that. When, when Jacob was supposed to be sitting around the fire listening to what he inherited from his father and his grandfather, instead, he's probably, he's probably thinking about me, myself, and I, and he missed. He missed his inheritance. So what happened? He almost missed his visitation. This is what he said. God's in this place. No kidding. Just look at the name of it. But he should have been listening to the campfire stories. 
He said, I did not know that God was in this place. That's what he said, right? But he should have. So by default, he ended up having to wrestle. And you know, he got a name change, but he limps now. To remind him, don't be an idiot. Every time he walked, it reminded him, it's not about him. You see, he didn't discern that in his loins was God's inheritance. That God is into people and generations. And that Jacob needed to carry out the plan for all of the ages. Just like now, at the end of this age, all of us, we should have a stadium full of people to listen to this. Not because of me, but because of the message. The message should never go out. The torch should never go out in a generation. So why is it that, that I accidentally go in for surgery and I, they give me too much nitrous and I pass away? Why does it have to be that is the way that I find out that the Bible's true and get sent back? It shouldn't be that way. You shouldn't have to die and be sent back. And I didn't want to come back. But I was sent back and he said, it's not about you, Kevin. It's about the people that I've sent you to. They need to hear this. Go back. And so when I went back, I was in a bad mood for months. <laughs> but why, does it, why is it that someone has to die and be sent back to find out that the Bible's true? And to find out that it's not Burger King, have it your way. You should be saying, where's the beef? <laughs> because you've been handed milk, and all it did was build you up in your soul. And then when this, this, these things happen on the earth, like a pandemic, then, then you, can't, you can't function well. Why? Because you were ministered to in your soul, but you weren't trained as a soldier to know how to go into your training. You didn't have any training to go to. So you were, your response was all emotional and out of fear. And fear actually deteriorates your immune system. And the thing of it was, is God trusts you in this generation, according to the Bible anyway. In Acts chapter 1 and in Acts chapter 17, both of those places, Jesus said it in Acts 1. He said, it's only for the Father to know the times and the seasons, not for us. Well, that just eliminates half the ministers because they got their DVD set on the book of Revelation. Okay, in, in 17, it says that the Father God knows every person that lives on the earth and at what time and what season, and they were designated that way by the Father. So that means that God trusts us at this time to be on the earth. So if we are trusted, then we must be trained we must be prepared, right? I mean, he, if he trusts us, then he, would, he wouldn't certainly say good luck. But see, religion will teach you that God is distant and that, it, you know, he may, he may be in a good mood or he may not be. You might go to heaven, you might not. And the, the, fate, the, the fate of you is not known because you might be destined to go to hell. There's religions that teach that. The reformers teach that. They're clouds without rain. That's what Jude says and James says. They're clouds without rain. That means they, they look like rain clouds, but they never rain. It's the form of godliness, but denying the power of it. Paul says don't even eat with those kind of people. They claim to be Christians, but they deny the power of God. The only hope we have is the resurrection. That's power. Okay, so getting into insulting the spirit of grace, which is what we do when we do not allow the, the rock that was struck, we don't allow it to be enough. Because it gets into this, and it's interesting that it talks about 
Paul talks about the rock that followed them in the desert that gave water, the rock at Horeb. But it says that, that the rock followed them in the desert. It says that. So we know that Moses was told to strike the rock and water came out. The second time, though, God said, go up and, and speak to it. And he struck it again. Well, it's interesting because the author of Hebrews picks up on this. So Paul has already told us that that rock that followed him through the desert was Christ, okay? He says that. Okay, so let's tie this in um, as we read on here. Let, let us boldly hold tightly without wavering, this is verse 23, to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of the ways to motivate one another to, to acts of love and good works. Let us not le neg neglect meeting together, as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the, his return is drawing near. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have experienced and or received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Verse 27, there is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. Okay, wait a minute. He's talking to believers. He's talking about people that have received Christ. He said, dear friends, if we, he's talking to the church, if we deliberately... Okay, this, this is in the Bible. So why isn't it preached? Well, it's offensive. But see, what it does is it cleans up our act. It cleans us up. It's discipline. It's good. It's good for us. He, God loves those he disciplines. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Okay, so there is only terrible expectation of judgment and raging fire. Doesn't sound good. Okay, uh, verse 20, for anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled, trampled on the Son of God and treated the blood of the covenant which God made, which God made us holy. So we are holy because of that blood. Okay, it says it right here as if it were a common and unholy thing, and have insulted, insulted, did I mention insulted? Insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit. This, in other translations, it says Spirit of Grace. Okay, who brings God's mercy to us. For we know that one has said, I will take revenge and I will pay them back. In other words, Paul told people, at the, those at the table, be sure that when you come to the table of the Lord that you discern the body of Christ and you discern this as a holy thing that Jesus asked you to do to remember him until he comes. And he said, if you, do, if you drink of that cup unworthily, you drink judgment unto yourself. And this is why you're weak, sick, and some of you die early. This is what the, what the apostle that wrote most of the New Testament said. So you can insult the spirit of grace. And what, what Moses did was he insulted the spirit of grace because you can only strike, it says in Hebrews, it says you can only strike Christ once. You can't strike them twice. And it's, it goes on to say, I'm just saving time, that those who have tasted of the, of the power of the coming age and, the, and encountered the blood of Jesus, if they were to denounce Christ publicly or else they, they would say, I don't want him anymore and tell the world like some ministers have done. He says there is no forgiveness for that sin because you would have to have Christ crucified again publicly so that you can accept him publicly is what it really says. Does everybody understand what I just said? So that is why it was such a terrible sin for Moses to strike the rock twice because essentially it says that that rock was Christ. And he cannot be struck twice. He cannot be crucified twice. Everybody follow me. 
nobody understands this. And so what happens is we, we encounter judgment instead of encountering the mercy. We, we don't discern the body. So Adam and Eve, when, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were told not to eat of that tree, that was God's tree. God is the only one that can know good and evil and still only do good. He cannot be tempted. But we are an image. Adam and Eve were perfect. They lived forever. They were like God. They were made in his image. You know, if you, in Genesis 1.26, it says this. But they were an image, which means you couldn't tell the difference if you held up the image and the original. And so God had to put that tree in there and eat from it in front of them and tell them, don't touch this tree. Because they would start to think because they had dominion over everything. I mean, everything's listed there that they had dominion over. I mean, there was nothing left. And they lived forever. They were never sick. They weren't worried about the, the next Greek alphabet letter that was coming next week. They, weren't, they were never concerned in any way about anything. But they were not God. But after a while, they probably started thinking they, they were God. And so they would look at that tree, and that was the only thing that was standing between them being God and them being like God. Does everybody understand this? That's why the tree was there. That was never their tree. Just like the tithe is not yours. It was never yours. That tree was never yours. That's God's tree. So if he gives you something and it's his, it's never yours. Just like the gifts of the Spirit. They're not yours. You're, you're, you, who you are is not, your, is not the gifts of the Spirit. Those are borrowed. But if you build your ministry off of that, then that's not really you, and it's, mis, it's, it's misinterpreting what's going on because you aren't that good. But see, look what's happened. Look what has happened. Jesus called me Kevin. He didn't call me anything else. He called me Kevin. And he told me, go back and obey me. Go back and do the works. Tell the people what you saw and heard. Bring unity and maturity to the body of Christ. It's the power is in the message. The manifestation of the message is God's job. We preach the word and he confirms his word with. Okay, so we preach the word and what does he do? He confirms it with signs and wonders. So we don't do the miracles, he does. You don't prophesy, he prophesies through you. I mean, if it's really you, if, I mean, if it's really him, if it's really you, then, you know, and then it's just you, then we got, just got you. So me, myself, and I is a very small world. And, you know, I have a message called, Why is my world so small? And, and the subtitle is because me, myself, and I live there. <laughs> so you fight yourself. You have arguments with yourself <laughs> in a small war every day within yourself. Well, that, that's not a good soldier. I mean, if, you, if you're fighting yourself, I don't want you in my army. But look at the condition. We, we, have to, we have to look at the word of God, see our reflection from the word of God. That's the image. Okay, so God, God never intended for us to eat from that tree. We can't handle that. Does everybody understand that? You cannot handle evil. We were never supposed to know evil. Ever. We didn't need to know you. We just need to know the right answers, not the wrong ones. Who cares about the wrong answers? But the news focuses on the three wrong answers. There's only one right answer and a multiple choice, usually. Okay. So can I um, start my sermon here? We still... Okay, I got 15 minutes. That's good. Okay. This, uh, this verse in chapter 9... Uh, page three. 
But Christ came as a high priest of good things to come with the greater and the more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood. He entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer, sprinkling of the unclean, sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Jesus Christ, who through the eternal spirit, through the eternal spirit, that's how he did it. He did it through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot, without defect to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So we are able, because we're called, we're able to receive the promise of the eternal covenant inheritance or the ter eternal covenant. And Peter picks up on this. And the supernatural events that happen during the day are supposed to be these kind of things. Because Peter says that through these precious promises or through the covenant, and this is in, in the second Peter chapter one, if you start with verse three and just read through that chapter, it's amazing what you'll find. It's, he picks up on this eternal covenant and he says these promises that we've been given, it says that through these promises, we, we can partake or be a participator in the divine nature. What is the divine nature? Well, if you're around God, everything about his word is true. Everything the spirit is saying is true. You have this, this uh, mix of the word of God being ignited by the spirit and you have a prophetic event, which means you're, you become a seer if you're not. You, you become right instead of being a nimwit. You become correct all of a sudden. And, and you become that highway of holiness that's talked about in, uh, in um, Isaiah 35, where it says that, that there's a highway of holiness. And even one translation says, listen to me very closely. At least pretend like you're listening right now. It says, even if a fool accidentally finds himself on this highway of holiness, he ceases to be a fool while on it. And that's why it says, Solomon said it, even a fool is thought to be wise if he is silent. In other words, if somebody's quiet, you can't locate them. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so you can locate somebody by just letting them talk. And then you decide if you want to go where they're going. Because guess what? If you join with them, you're going where they're going. Or it's going to be a fight. And you think it's, it's a fight arguing with yourself. Get someone else that sides with your flesh. And then they're voting you off the island while you're sleeping. They're having meetings without you. See, you've got to listen to where people are going. And if you can't correct the rudder, then you might want to reconsider being in covenant with them. But if you're going to call the things that are not as though they were like God is, well, then I'm going to, I'm going to partner with him. And I'm going to find people that have this divine nature. They're partakers of the divine nature. In other words, they have partaken of the promises, these precious promises, and they've broken through. They become prophetic events. As people, they become a prophetic event. In other words, they, they live and move and have their being, and they're prophetic. They see, and it's called a Christian. See, so I don't, I don't necessarily, uh, I, I don't talk a lot about the fivefold ministry of the church because I just want to talk about the church. The fivefold is supposed to be building you up. I mean, if you want to you know, include Ephesians in the Bible. Paul said that the fivefold is supposed to be ministering to the body until we reach maturity of the saints and unity. So that, it says, so that the body can go out and minister. 
And this was the plan from the beginning because you see it in the book of Acts. It said, let us set apart those who can wait on the tables. Stephen, who was not an apostle or a prophet. And yet he, it says he had notable miracles in his ministry. And he was a table waiter. And it says, so that the apostles can give time to prayer and the word. And Stephen got stoned because he had notable miracles and nobody, they grit, it says they gritted their teeth when he spoke. They took him out and they stoned him. And Paul, Saul, was part of that. So what was, was, the, the, what was the fear that the Pharisees had of a Denny's table waiter? What, what was it that they wanted to kill Stephen and not one of the apostles? Stephen was a prophetic event. He spoke. He said, he, he nailed them. I guarantee you, he didn't get an offering that day. But he became one. And, and if you preach the gospel, that's the way it'll be too. You won't get an offering, but you will be an offering. Because Jesus only lasted three and a half years, and he did the will of the Father. Three and a half years. And they killed him because he did the will of the Father. Look what happened. Look what happened to our nation during those precious four years. But those kind of people get sailed down the river very quickly. If you listen... The voice was the same voice of a deliverer like Moses, like, like uh, the prophets. They, they, they were gathering the people back. They, David became a hero because he was for the people. But he had to meet in a cave until Saul was killed. Jesus said, you know, even the foxes and the birds have a place to lay their head, but I, I do not have a place to stay. The front desk person in Bethlehem didn't even allow Mary and Joseph to check in with a late check-in. So the animals got to share a space with Jesus. Where were the Pharisees who had all the prophets that prophesied about the Messiah, where were they when Jesus was born? Why did the shepherds know about it? Why did the, the wise men, which were magi, which is the word magician, by the way, the one to spoil, I can say it because I'm not in church, it really spoils a party when you find out that these were magicians that were following the astrology. We've come because of the star. Magi. Okay, so they're notified. The shepherds know. Fluffy knows. But where's the Pharisees? Where is the religious denomination of the day? They had all the prophets. The Messiah had come. Do you understand? Okay. Ooh, page two. I think it's further than I've ever got. Okay, so God requires blood. If you look at the top of the page here, we got, we got blood being introduced. It's not where you think it is. It's, it's hidden, and I want to leave you with this. It's very important that you understand the, the whole thing about the fig leaves and the fig tree. Listen to me very carefully. Don't make me come out here. Oh, I am out here. Listen to me. When Adam and Eve chose to believe the serpent that they were left out, that there was something being held back, when they believed that lie and their, their ability to know evil as well as good happened, 
they lost their innocence, which means they lost their robe of righteousness, which means that they were exposed. And this happened when I, got, when I was out of my body. My body is on the table in the operation. That's my earth suit. So I can't function in this realm without that body because the environment only allows me to function with that suit. If I want to go to space, I wear a space suit. At 60,000 feet, if you don't have the proper suit on, your blood starts to boil. So your environment down here is you are a spirit. You're going to live somewhere forever. Your eternal being came from God. You know, the spirits of just men made perfect on Mount Zion. You know, you know that verse. You, you have a soul. You have a mind, will, and emotions. And you live in a body. So you have your earth suit. You have the soul which ties your body and your spirit to have an experience while you're in this realm. But when you leave your body... You're clothed with another garment. And this garment is a robe of righteousness. However, there will come a day when the resurrection happens and you will get a resurrection body, which, is, which puts us back. It's a different body. And I couldn't look at myself when the, I, the Lord allowed me to see that happen, even though it hasn't happened, it's in the future. I... I looked, well, I can't say that because you'll be offended, so I'll water it down. I looked like, I looked like Jesus. I had to look away because I was perfect. My resurrection body. Now, I could function outside in the spirit realm, but I could not contact this realm anymore. Now, when they lost their innocence, they lost their covering. So they appeared to be naked. They had never seen themselves like this before because the flesh was glorified. And it's kind of like Enoch. And if you talk to Enoch and Elijah, they'll explain this all to you because they were wrapped up and taken to heaven with their bodies. And Jesus now is, has his body. But yeah, he can walk through walls. But he still has his body. The blood is not in his body, but it's at the Father's throne. But he has a body, and he is a man on the throne. He's a God-man. But that offends people too. But Jesus has a human body. But it's glorified now. But we have a glorified body coming. So what did God, God do and what did Adam and Eve do? This is how we're going to end it tonight. And then we're going to worship. So the worship team, get ready. The power of God is strong here. But see, what you need is you need to be able to come to the table of the Lord and not be judged. See, you think you got something going on in your body and in your mind and you're weak. What it is, is you just need to discern what Jesus did for you and stop striking him again. Stop working at insulting the spirit of grace. Don't insult what God has already done. Don't try to do it better. Don't try to do something that's already done. Okay? So what happened was, if you were, were exposed like that, because you ate, then what happens is you're, you feel uncovered. Well, you're just going to grab the first thing, even if it's someone else's beach towel. You're just going to grab, I mean, you're going to make that umbrella a dress. You're going to do whatever you have to do to cover yourself because you just become uncovered. But a second ago, you were not. Okay, so what they did was they grabbed the thing that was the closest to them. Where does it say, where in the Bible does it say that the fruit that they ate was an apple? Okay, well, if that's the case, they would have grabbed an apple leaf. 
What did they grab? Bingo. What did Jesus curse? Why? That was man's solution. Man's solution was to cover their sin. God's solution is to wipe it away with blood. So that's why Jesus looked at that tree and cursed it. Because that is man's religion. So he cursed that tree and then he hung on that tree. Because it says cursed is any man that hangs on a tree. That's what it says in the law. Why would he even say that? If you really, really look into it, it was a tree that was prophesied that he would hang on. So he hung on that tree. He completely fulfilled. So we don't need fig leaves anymore. It is completely finished. Okay, so I don't like it when people get weird. The reason why is, is that what people need to hear is what I just said. They don't need me to lay hands on them, for you to wait in line for three hours, for me to prophesy over you. You just got a word. And there's more presence of God in here than there would be in somebody laying hands on you. But you do, you do, you, because you've been tuned to do it this way, you think, okay, if, if I could just get a word personally from this person, you know, then, then I'm going to do everything that God asked me to do, and I'm going to be fine. It's like, well, you know, that has already happened. You've had many words. And Paul said to Timothy, he said, you know those prophecies that I gave you? He said, wage war with them. Take those prophecies and wage war. Well, if the prophecies were from God and they're, they're true, then why well, they're going to come to pass? See, that's the mentality we have. Well, why would Paul tell Timothy you got to wage war with those words? Well, because they're not in stone. Because the new covenant is based on free will. It's conditional based on your participation in it. It's by faith. Everything in the New Testament is by faith. In the Son of God. Which means that if God said it, he's not just going to do it, you're going to do it. Because James, who wouldn't be invited to your church, he said... You show me your faith by what you do. Not what, you know, you tell me you have great faith. Well, I, I show my faith by what I do. This process that we've gone through tonight is so pivotal for your life. Because the Spirit was so willing. Jesus said, you know, and you'll see this in heaven, that that garden, that Mount of Olives, that was the garden. Jesus spent that hour in prayer there because he took back the garden for man. You're going to find out that that was the exact spot. What he did was he fought the devil and he took it back. See, you don't see these things, but that's Mount Moriah. But that was the garden. You're, you're trying to figure out where the garden is? Looking at all the YouTube videos, trying to figure out where the Garden of Eden was, where Noah's Ark is? <laughs> The disputed territory is Jerusalem. Melchizedek, who didn't have a birth certificate like some of our presidents, didn't even have a, a origin or a death certificate. He came out and collected tithes from Abraham, who was coming up from the battle of the kings, which was Sodom and Gomorrah and all those evil cities. He came out to meet Abraham, and Abraham gave him tithes. But this is before the law. Before there were required tithes. How did Abraham know to give tithes? Well, how did Abel know to give a sacrifice of a lamb? How did they know about blood? Because God took the skin of an animal and gave it to them. And said, take the fig leaves off. It's going to be by blood. Those animals died. 
Because blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of sin. God set this in motion back there in, in the garden. Am I right? They he had to wear what animals skins. So the fig tree didn't work. That's man's way of taking care of sin. So if you are wearing a fig tree, a fig tree, a fig leaf, if you're wearing a fig tree, I, I really want to get a picture. Can I get a picture with you? If you, if you have a fig leaf on, if, if religion, if you attending church and giving in the offering and getting all the jargon and all the talk, but you can't love God with all your heart, you can't love your neighbor, and you can't love yourself, because it says love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said it. So it's three things. you got to love God, and you got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. you got to love yourself. Now, I'm not talking about looking in the mirror all the time. What I'm saying is, is that you have value inside of you. You do not insult the spirit of grace who has bought you. You're a partaker of the divine nature through these promises. So this weekend is going to be really good. But once you have your mind framed, Jesus is all about people. He said, Kevin, it's not about you. You're going back. And I woke up on the operating table crying because I had to come back. Because I I know what's going on behind the scenes here. And you think that people falling up the steps to their aircraft is bad three times. You should see what's behind tripping up people. You should see what's around you trying to trip you up, telling you that you're not worth anything. And, you know, when it comes down to it, you know when you sit in church and all they want is your money. You know that. You know that they don't care anything about you. It's not supposed to be that. Church is supposed to be a safe place to go. Jesus started the church. He said the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church. He started the church. He is the church. You're supposed to be able to go to church and, and go there to get well. A hospital is for sick people. It's not an apartment complex. If you get well, you don't stay there. They're going to kick you out. Why? Because the whole goal is for you to become well. The only people that stay at a hospital are the staff. If you want to become staff and help people, then you stay there. But see, the church is a hospital for sick people. But there has to come a point where you become well. The world system will not want you to get well. Religion has gotten that world system in it. Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. It says in Acts 10, 38, it's still in the Bible, I checked tonight. It says he went around doing good. Why? Because he was doing what his father told him to do. He's a good God, he does good. He went around doing good. Then it says, comma, healing everyone that was oppressed of the devil. So not only do we know what the works of God are through Jesus Christ, but we know the origin which the fallen world, the God of this world, the small g, that Paul talked about, the principality of the air, he said that each one of us used to obey. We had no way of resisting him until we came into Christ. And now we have been translated or transferred into the kingdom of light. So these are all scriptures. This is all Bible that I brought together for you as an introduction tonight to know that you are under an amazing covenant and really, as the church, of the, the authentic church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are the most powerful, part of the most powerful organization on the earth, the body of Christ, which not is necessarily everybody that's in church. That is why the Bible addresses people as, as sometimes need to shape up your, your lukewarm, and I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. That's what Jesus said to the churches that were in northern Turkey, which you call the seven churches. They're in, they were in northern Turkey. They, they don't exist anymore. One of them was Laodicea, which he said, Jesus said to John, write to the Laodiceans, and he said, you say you're rich, well, well clothed, and can see. But really, you're poor, naked, and blind. And they didn't know it. Now, If you turn to your Bible to Ephesians, in the original manuscript, it actually has Laodicea there too. 
It was written, Paul wrote to the Laodiceans because he says it in, in the first couple of verses. So Paul, during his ministry, spoke to the Laodiceans. And if you read Ephesians, you're reading what Paul wrote to them. Then you read what Jesus said to them, and now they're gone. And this is all in a time span of they messed it up within 30 to 40 years of Jesus being on the earth. Jesus is appearing to John, telling right to them, and he's telling Paul right to them, and they still disappeared. And this has always been the problem is that people are deceived and they don't know they're deceived, which is the epitome of deception. So when people do evil, they think they're doing good. And people get to the place where if where they're at is not effective, they move out from the establishment. And if you read church history, this happens every single generation. All the people that are your heroes, they were hated in their day. They wanted to kill the prophets. They wanted to kill the apostles. Every single hero in this century, they wanted to kill. Oral Roberts announced in the Episcopal Church, he said, God's a good God. They kicked him out. He had to get a tent because they, they determined that he was misleading the people by telling them that, he was, that God was good. I kid you not. The Wesley brothers, Whitfield was kicked out of the church. He went out onto the sidewalk. I stood in front of that church he got kicked out of and stood on that sidewalk where he preached to people on the street because they would not allow him in the church. If you look at all the heroes in history, they all got kicked out of the establishment. It started with Jesus. Jesus went to the synagogue. The board member was sitting on the front row. His the wife was the, the worship leader, and Jesus stood up to preach, and that man manifested a devil. Everything was fine until Jesus showed up to preach. That devil had never heard anything that would cause him to get upset. And it says that man manifested, threw himself down, and Jesus cast the devil out of it. Then... He wasn't invited back. <laughs> Why? Because you're messing up. You're messing it up. Well, don't you think that man needed delivered? Well, then they said, well, you can't heal on the Sabbath. He goes, well, well, you want me to wait till the next day? When this person is a daughter of Abraham, doesn't she deserve to be well? Well, you can't work on, on the Sabbath. He goes, well, I can't go to Chick-fil-A on the Sabbath either. No. It's like, it's like you've got to be kidding me. Jesus went around doing good. He was healing everyone that was oppressed of the devil. So the law, the church at the time, was restricting God from being good. So there was confrontation. Jesus, he would show up, and you know, they did, they did the reading of the scroll of, of the, of, of the uh, Torah. They, they, they had the law and the prophets, and they had a sequence, and they'd just roll it and then open it, and that was the reading for that week. So it just so happens that they're in the prophecy in Isaiah for, about Jesus. So he just goes like this and he goes, well, this is, this is really interesting. <laughs> and he reads it and he goes, this is fulfilled in your hearing. This is me. And he sits down. Everybody, it says everybody just sat and stared at him. Well, see, the thing of it is, is if God starts to move in your life and you start fulfilling prophecy, there's going to be people who are going to stare at you. Because not everyone falls into the synchronization or the plan that God has. Why? Because it's a narrow way. So what happens is God will reach you because you are diligently seeking him. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Those 
uh, those who love God, he rewards those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Okay, well, wait a minute. If God wants me to find him, he'll reveal himself to me. No, it says that you have to diligently seek him. So it's not automatic. Just like prophecy is not automatic. People are going to disobey God and things are not going to happen the way they're supposed to. This happened with Jesus in his own hometown. He couldn't even heal in his own hometown because of their unbelief. He, he said before he was crucified, he stood on the Mount of Olives, looked over Jerusalem. I've seen this. I've been there. Looked over and he said, how I long to gather you. But you wouldn't have it. You didn't discern your day of visitation. And this has been the case, just like in the book of Revelation, in those first couple of chapters where that happened with, with the visitation of Jesus on the Isle of Patmos. Okay, so you have been made righteous. You're never going to be any more righteous than you are right now. Your, your position is righteous. Your position is holy. You're as holy as you're going to get. Be ye holy as God is holy. I mean, if you want to bring the Bible into it. If you don't, you know, then good luck with that. But your position is secure through the blood of Jesus. Now, relationship-wise, it says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, which is a whole other thing, which means you might have to go help Pastor Sixto distribute food. Or you might have to go to a Warrior Notes events and help set up or help with the book table. It's not just you sitting and watching classes, which is good, and I'm fine with that. But I have almost, we're going on 27,000 students. Okay, so in my view, all of you that are students, you are capable of conducting a Bible study every week. And so that's why we have the Warrior Fellowships. Okay, so there's a discrepancy problem here. And I know that some of it is just because it's going to be hard to manage 26,000 people. It's hard enough as a student, but then we have these Royal Fellowships. When we, when we launched it, we limited it to 1,200. So we have 1,200 all over the world, which now are growing to where they need, some of them need buildings. Okay, so we upped it another couple hundred and got 1,400. But see, really, in the eyes of God, I mean, if, you, if you're asking me, I can't hear if you're asking me, but when I was in heaven, I saw that all 26,000 should be having a Bible study every week. You, you can do a Bible study. Well, I'm not part of the fivefold ministry. Good. <laughs> I found out that most people that are, that are called, they don't go to the chosen because they're not qualified. The reason they're not qualified is they do not submit to discipline. And they do not allow themselves to be trained. So few are chosen, but many are called. But I can mess with those numbers by having spirit schools and having schools and then having people pack food and give to people that can't pay you back and give out, help me give out money. Help me get kids involved with aviation and get them to be pilots because next year we were notified, next year there will be 13,000 empty seats in the pilot section of the airplane. In the cockpit next year, 13,000 slots become available because of what's going on, okay? And I was told that every year thereafter there will be 13,000. So even if you got, we got 13,000 students through, we would still have the deficit every year into the future. Okay, so why not just help kids decide at a younger age by creating homeschool that is actually tailor-made toward finding out what their gifting is? And we, we have the ability to put them on a fast track. They can actually graduate with their high school diploma at 13 and 14, and then by 15 be, have their associate degree, and they can just continue on the whole way through their doctorate. 
And at the same time, we can put them through flight training or if they want to be a mechanic, we can put them through that. If they want to do food preparation, we have the ability to put them on a fast track with that training. We're, we're working with the FAA right now to become completely qualified in every area. They're helping us right now to make this a fast track. God is sending people high up that are in my meetings, that are partners, that can put it on a fast track to help people find their place. They can help us to help people right now. Pastor Sixto, is it true that every week you have 22 pallets of food available in Tampa? And that same institution would donate that food all over the United States if we could back a truck up to their dock. So like here and everywhere, it's not just in Tampa, it could be in other cities. They said, just back your truck up. And I'm like, okay, so I don't need one truck, I need a whole bunch of trucks. Do you hear how I'm talking? What I'm saying is this stuff is all available. There, there is a deficit. Did you know right now, drone pilots, they need drone pilots. There's, there's 18 year olds that are making six figures as drone pilots right now. Why? Because the corporations no longer make men and women climb up towers to inspect gauges. They use drones. So if you have your private and possibly just your instrument rating, and you get your drone rating, you, uh, a, a, a corporation will hire you right now. So why not create a fast track for kids to get qualified, get them their private, their instrument rating, and then get them their drone license? And you know what? I don't expect them to come back and pay me back. But see, within a crisis, there's always opportunity. In every crisis, there's an opportunity. But see, we focus on the crisis, and we buy the DVDs and the books, and we become fearful, and we become incapacitated at a time of promotion. Are you speaking to the giant like David did? Today, sir, I'm going to feed you to the birds. You are going to be fed to the birds today. He, it says he ran at him. talking to him are you talking to your enemy okay now as I stood here and said that and I looked over here I was in the spirit I'm not going to be bashful anymore I'm just I'm tired of holding back I was in the spirit and it lit up in here and there was a bright, a bright light that happened as I looked that way. And what I saw was Mount Zion where the spirits of righteous men made perfect are. It's in the Bible, in Hebrews, okay? It lit up and I saw all of us standing there on display. And what I saw, I saw, I saw that what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, just, I'm just helping the bride's gown to get the spots and the wrinkles out. That's all I'm doing. I'm just kind of talking to the bride, getting the bride ready for what's going to happen. Now, I saw this like in a flash, and I saw that everyone in here makes it. But now you have to reverse engineer your destination. You have to what we call interpolate. So you extrapolate, you can take all the data and you can take data and build a trend out, extrapolate out. But you can interpolate backwards with the data and you can see the path from the, the past. Well, if God is standing in your future and Psalms 139.5 is true, which says that I, the Lord, have paved a way to your future and I'm standing in it. And I also come behind you to protect you from your past. That is the Passion Translation, verse 5 of Psalms 139. You ought to put that in your pipe and smoke it instead of that other stuff. 
if God is standing in your future and he's paved a way, a pathway for you to walk on, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. That literally says they're numbered in sequence. Yes. Mm. I'm telling you, you're staring at the wrong thing. You're staring at yourself. You're staring at your inabilities. But there are people that love you. There are people that respect you. You, you aren't with your tribe yet, but you're going to be. Listen, Joshua and Caleb, you ought to talk to them because they went through what we're going through right now in this country. They did everything right. They voted their conscience. They did everything right. And they had to suffer for 40 years. Thank God we're not going to have to suffer for 40 years. But I think we've learned our lesson. Joshua and Caleb had a good report. They did everything right and they suffered for 40 years because of the people. They did not discern their day of visitation. The people of Israel, it was a 14-day walk. You didn't even have to jog. Fluffy would have beat you. 14 days into the promised land. 40 years, why? It says it in Hebrews. In Hebrews it says, don't be like them who through their unbelief, they did not enter into the promised land. It was unbelief. Well, this is what grieves the spirit of grace. This is what insults the spirit of grace, according to scripture, is when you don't discern that it's already been done for you. Amen? Amen. Now, there's a lot of you in here are suffering physically, and the spirit of the Lord is willing to heal in this room right now. However, it has to do with you receiving because Jesus is not going to be struck again. There is no other action going to be taken for your healing. According to Isaiah, when you read Isaiah 53, he already suffered for your healing. It was by his stripes you are healed. Now, Peter repeats that scripture, but he says, you were healed. Past tense. If you were not fearful, your immune system would not be compromised. Because if you ask the nurse in the house or the doctor in the house, they'll tell you that that the number one compromiser of the immune system is fear. So tonight, I'm, I'm, we're going to worship, and, and I want you to participate. I want the kids. Are there kids in here? Where are the kids at? Okay, I want you to come up and get a, a flag. We got Ukrainian flags here, too. We're going to pray for Ukraine, and we got really cool flags for the kids. I want the kids to worship. Now, we usually have about 100 kids in most of our meetings, but this is a new city, and it'll get bigger, but we usually have 1,500 to 2,000 people and 100 kids. But I want the kids to come up, and I want the kids to grab a flag, and we're going to worship, and I want the kids to worship it. And, you know, if you somehow during this, this time, if you start to feel like a kid, get up here and get a flag. <laughs> you're, you're free to worship. You're free to sing. You're free, you're free to worship uh, God, in any way that you want, as long as you are walking in love and you don't nail somebody with a flag in, in the head. So you think of other people. Now, this is not like some churches, but this is church. The children should be allowed to worship. They should be allowed to come up and draw. Why do you not feel uncomfortable during a ball game? I mean, is your, is your God not greater than your team? You know, can we not worship God to where, you know, like King David, he, his wife unfriended him for worshiping God. When, 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 when do you just kind of just let it go and realize this? 
God is in your future, he's standing there and he's bidding you to come to that. that your future is, is now to God. Like to God, your future is now. He, he doesn't see a difference. He's calling things that are not in your life as though they were. He, his promises are, are precious, but they're also true. And he is able to accomplish anything. And I'm never going to stop preaching this, this message. It doesn't matter to me. God is a good God and he loves us. And he wants us to come in line with what he has already said. I'm, I'm, I'm assuring you that the Spirit of God that has spoken over your life, that He is willing at this very point to bring it to pass. There has to be manifestation. It has to be faith. You have to have faith in your heart, and you have to take that and implement it in. And I'm, I'm willing to walk you into that. It's through worship. It's through speaking back to God. Hey, kids, don't hide over there. Come over here. Don't hide. Okay, so we're going to pray for Ukraine. My, my, wife, my wife is going to take that microphone. She just found out she is right now. And she's going to lead us in prayer. She's going to lead us in worship. And um, I, want you, I want you to stand because this, you have to be in the mode to give. And... and Sitting seems to be like a receiving mode. And we gotta we gotta stand just for a minute and then we'll see you tomorrow. We're gonna start, we're gonna actually start worshiping around 9:30 and praying around 9:20, 9:30 tomorrow. So it's not gonna start at 10. It never starts when we say it is because I'm always early for everything. We're gonna always come early, we're always gonna do more than what's published. This is a great opportunity for Amarillo to encounter the visitation of the Spirit of God through the blood of Jesus being applied. And we can do that by acknowledging every good thing that we have in Christ. Now, I'm announcing this to you because Jesus said, go into a city and announce that their sins are forgiven. Announce, just like Paul said, we're ambassadors. We announce that your sins have been paid for. Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sins. I am announcing to you that you are forgiven. I have the power, if you want to bring the Bible into it, to announce that people's sins are forgiven through the blood of Jesus. There, everything has been met in your life. Your file, according to Romans 8, chapter 1, your file is no longer in existence in heaven. The case against you is closed, it says. There is no accusing voice against you. The file has been completely expunged. And there, your, your past is gone. I know this. It's the most profound thing that I encountered in heaven. Is that Jesus does not know about your past because his blood completely erased it. There is no record of your sin according to Romans chapter 8 verse 1. So if you're free and you have no case against you, your sins are completely forgiven right now from your past, then I would suggest that you act like it. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 If that's you and you want to thank God for your sins being erased, just say it. Say thank you. That's me. That's me. If you're online and you say that sounds too good to be true, that's okay. Say that's me. Thank you, Jesus, for erasing my sins with your pure, spotless blood. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We give you the glory, Lord. We give you the glory. The glory of the Lord. Your glory reign. The reign of your glory reign. And Lord, we just thank you for all these kids. Thank you, kids. Just worship the Lord. Thank him. Lord, we thank you for moving in Ukraine. We thank you for a nation being born in a day. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? No. Can a nation be born in a day? Yes. 
shuffle. And now we're just going to pray in the spirit a little bit because we want to receive. We want to water that word that just went into us. Okay, so we're going to pray in the spirit. We're going to water that word. We're not just going to get busy. We're going to stay in the spirit and we're going to pray. And we're going to let the Holy Spirit get us to a place where he wants us to be. And then we're going to pray and declare some things, okay? So just dokona mashte. And remember, your family is a nation, okay? Your family is a nation. Your city is a nation. A nation can be born in a day. Kobona ambashe. We're praying in the Holy Ghost because that's what Jesus said. It's better that I go away. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. This is his, this is God's idea. It doesn't make sense, but it says when we pray in the Spirit, we're praying out mysteries, okay? And we're changing things. We're praying out what the Holy Spirit wants prayed. Shabote, nasondo, ramaste, masondo, ramaste, prepo kuste. Let the Holy Spirit pray through you. Maravande, gorobose, basho torre, basho torre, basho torre. Baso torre, 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 basande shande shoro corra base te que se coso coce, borra baba base, borra baba base, orra masa te kiyama coso. More glory, Lord, more de she, more glory. Lift up your voices. Lift up your voices. This is a great place to get some stuff done in the spirit. Halamondorra mahaya mahaya mahorra mahaso. Orra baba basa korra baba se. Orra baba baba she kebe se korra baba so. Orra mama maso morra mama se. Orra baba basha korra baba se. Oh, we lift our voice. On the behalf of the Ukraine. Oh, we lift our voices. We stand in the gap. We plead your blood. We hold up the blood stained banner. Over the church, over your people, over the nations. Oh, mananesi kere manana manana. Oh, ne manana si kere ni ene. Oh, zima ne ne na 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 ya. Oh, zima ne ne na ne ne na ne ne ne. So the mande ishi kere ni brasi ni bashi. Oh, the mashi. Oh. Nation to nation, Reba Bando Romande, nation to nation, Reba Bando Romando Romando Romande, Oraman, not a mind, Oraman, not a mind, Sidimane, Sidimane, Ramamane, and a mamma, mamma, oh. Every day, she came. Song, great, 
You're there in the fire. You're there in the midst of it all. You're there in the fire. Cause you say you never leave, and you say you never forsake them. You're in the fire. You're in the fire. To come out on the other side. Victorious, victorious, you'll come out on the other side. Victorious, victorious, cause your God is your defender. Covering you, covering you, your shield, oh God is your defender. Oh, the banner of love covering covering it's the banner of your love it's covering covering no weapon formed against you no weapon formed against you will prosper no weapon formed against you never forsake you never leave you never forsake you never leave you never leave you never leave you never leave it's not who you are God it's not who you are you're not one to run away you're not one to hide it's not who you are it's not who you are you're our great defender Ukraine and your love you don't run away and you don't hide you're the great defender you're the great defender in the midst of the fire in the midst of it all there you are there you are there you are In the midst of it all, there you are, 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 you can be found in the midst of it all. Cause you don't hide and you don't run away. There you are, 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 there you are. of it all in the midst of it all there you are cause you hear every cry you hear every cry God you hear every cry you hear every cry you don't turn away you don't turn away you hear every Fighting the word says there 
declare it in Jesus' name that you're going to move mightily in the Ukraine, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you're taking care of business. I thank you, Lord, that this prophetic word and these prayers are going before, yes, before your throne and these precious children waving the flag, Lord. We're believing for change even tonight, Lord. Lord, we declare it and believe it and thank you for everything that you have done tonight. We thank you for everything you're going to do this weekend, Lord. You are truly a mighty God, Lord. We, and we thank you for the blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Remember what Kevin said? Please try to be here by 930 because that's when he wants to start worship and prayer. So we'll see you in the morning. God bless you. And also, if you parked in the garage, they're going to tell you on the way out that you can get your ticket validated at the front, front desk, okay? God bless you. One last thing, also, if you're a student, we could use some help putting some packs together. So if you're a student and you want to come a little bit early, about 8 a.m., we, Pastor Sixto and some others could use your help putting some, breaking the pallets down or getting it all set up for distribution. So we'll see you then. Is that mic on, baby? That like...